Let's stand and read God's Word together from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've kind of been camped on this passage for a while, and uh, we have a few more sermons to go, uh, talking about this very important end times sort of instruction by Paul, given, you know, uh, back in the, the first century, when he says in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God, or object of worship, so that he takes up his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, that I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may re be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it, will do so until he is out of the way. And when the lawless one comes, or when the, law, um, when the lawless one will be revealed, the, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawlessness one, lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all his uh, power, false signs, and wonders with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth so as to be saved. Therefore, God sends a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. But you ought to always give thanks to God. We ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by God, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and, the God, and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Thank you. May be seated. So how many of you face needless stress in life? Right? Needless concerns, worry, anxiety, and difficulty in life because you fail to remember something important. Right? I think, I think that's probably every one of us, right? Something we we just forgot, something that we spaced out, right? Maybe we were to pick up our children uh, from an activity, right? And fail to remember uh, that we were supposed to do that. And then all of a sudden, it came to our mind, ah! you know, and we had all these images in our mind of our kids standing in a snowbank, you know, or something because we forgot. Or maybe we failed to remember an important appointment that we had on our schedule, or maybe maybe we failed to remember uh, filing important papers by a, a date or deadline, you know. Uh, uh, we found out in class uh, uh, the teacher just reminded that that the report was due, or or. I don't know how many people forget April 15th, but anyway, um, you know, those are, those are kind of um, earth-shaking moments. They kind of unsettle our life when we forget things. Now, we all know it's pretty easy to get preoccupied in life. A lot of things, a lot of things on our schedules, a lot of things going down. And with so many things in life that we can fail to remember some important spiritual truths from God's Word. Truths that were designed to guide our lives and to give us confidence and security in life. God's Word was, was, was written 
was provided for us to give us confidence and security, to give us hope, to give us strength uh, to live our lives, right? But when we get preoccupied with life, it's, it's easy to forget that stuff. Forget the things that God has supplied for us to have strength and security and confidence in life. And this was certainly the case for the believers, the early Christians at the city of Thessalonica. Because you see in chapter 2, verse 2, we see members of the church of the, uh, Thessalonica were described, how were they described? As quickly shaken from their composure. Quickly shaken from their composure. You know, I liken that to a team that's playing basketball, right? And, and you know, things are going okay. They're kind of just, you know, dribbling the ball up the court. You know, they're playing. And all of a sudden, there's a foul. Their opponents are shooting free throws. They make the, the free throws. And the guy goes to tan the ball out of bounds. And all of a sudden, they look and there's a press there. The, the opposing team is putting the pressure on. Now, you want to see composure change in a game. You watch what happens when a team all of a sudden, out of nowhere, throws a press on you. It's like, uh, uh, what do I do with this basketball now, right? And some teams are very prepared for that, and some teams aren't. And you can see some pretty wild things happen when you see that ball thrown in a lot of places. It wasn't meant to go, right? Because people are just kind of scared. And that's what's happening at Thessalonica. People are disturbed. They're quickly shaken from their composure, it says, and disturbed. Why? Because teaching has come to them from a source, being identified as coming from Paul, right, that says they're already living in the day of the Lord. <coughs> now, when they hear that, they say, wait a second, we missed the rapture, right? We missed the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering that Christ is going to do of His church. We're in the times of the Antichrist. We're in the times of the Great Tribulation. And if you're living in the time of the Great Tribulation and you know that, you have a lot of things to be shook up about. Because if you know how that day has been described to you, if you know the teaching and the instruction that's been provided to you about the day of the Lord, you know it's a time where God's going to bring judgment on the world for its sin. And if you read Revelation chapter 6 through 18, you see the tremendous turmoil that's going to come out of the world. Now, obviously, the Christians in Thessalonica didn't have this. Uh, revelation, right? But they had many passages in the Old Testament that they were referred to and that Paul had already instructed them in, uh, reminding them of this, this perilous time, this, this very dark day in Israel where God brings out His judgment, His wrath, right? But He's already told the Thessalonian Christians that God has not destined you to wrath, right? That, that's not God's destiny for you. That's not God's purpose. So when somebody says, hey, the message has changed, these guys are shaking in their composure. We're in the day of the Lord. This is, this is, the, this is the time of God's wrath. Wait a second. So, so they're really confused. All right? So in Paul's second letter, Paul's calling it time out. You, you know what it's like, guys. we got guys and gals that play basketball. When things are going a little helter-skelter, things aren't going well, the coach sees you lost your composure, you know, he does what Dickie Vitale says. Get a deal, baby, right? We call the time out to settle the troops, to kind of settle things down, to get perspective, to get a little instruction, to help sort of refocus the minds and the hearts of the, the people in the game so that they can go out and function well, right? And that's what Paul's doing in Thess 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's providing education, instruction. He's calling a spiritual time out. Right? Spiritual time. Hey, wait, wait. Calm down. This is okay. And he starts in this time out by saying kind of that, that thing that maybe, maybe, maybe you don't always want to hear. Um, don't you remember, you know, back in practice when we talked about these things? Don't you remember back in practice when we, we kind of showed you, you know, that the pressure would come on you? Do, don't you remember uh, how we said to counter that pressure, that this is what you need to do? 
When you see the pressure coming against you, when, when you see the adversity coming against you, here's what you do. You don't lose your composure. You go back and you remember the things. Hey, this is what, this is what, this is what's happening. This is how we instructed you. This is how we prepared. And that's essentially what Paul's doing, right? Because verse 5, you notice, comes in the form of a question. It's a question bringing with it a certain amount of conviction, right? It's conviction. So it's that question, you know, kind of like kids never want to hear their parents say to them. Um, don't you recall? Don't you remember? Uh, yeah, I think I do. Right? I seem to have forgotten. But I, I remember there was a discussion about this, right? You know, something happened. Maybe the, you know, the parents, don't you remember? Yeah. So here, here's that question, conviction. And what the question really reveals is, in their quickness to receive the word of false teachers, right? They forgot the teaching that they'd already been provided. They already received on this subject in the past. Notice Paul says, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you about these things? Obviously, he's implying in this question that these false statements that you heard should not have faced you one bit. They should have shaken your clothes. They should have set you off to worry, be anxious, without anything. Why? Because we already talked about this, right? We were given instruction, right? So this really emphasizes the first point in the message this morning on your outlines. Security, stability, and confidence in the Christian life. Do you want that? You want security? You want stability? You want confidence in your Christian life? Everybody say, that sounds like a good thing. You want your composure to be solid. You don't want to be shook up. Here's how it comes. It comes from my ability to remember and apply God's truth in my life. Sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? That's one of the hardest things to do in life, isn't it? Remember truth. Remember the truth. Not get all caught up in the externals and the emotions and the feelings and the situation and the circumstances. The one thing that anchors your soul, the one thing that gives you confidence, the one thing that gives you strength and foundation and security and confidence in your life is truth. Why? Because the truth is constant. It doesn't change. It always remains. God's confident truth is eternal. It doesn't change. You know, everything in life changes, right? Things are constantly changing. And it's always nice to know that there is one important thing in life that doesn't change. God doesn't change, right? He is character, he's immutable, he doesn't change, right? And his word is eternal. It doesn't change. It's always there. And so Paul says that. So Paul's question stresses our need to take, in life, to take the teaching of God's word seriously. Right? Take the teaching of God's word seriously. Okay? Write it down. Refresh your memory with it. That's why we give you the outlines. We give you the sheets of paper. And it's cool to see kids have notebooks and adults having notebooks. Writing some things down. Why? Because sometimes when you hear things, you have to go back and reference them. Right? You go back. Okay. You know, I'm facing a time that could easily shake me up. So how do I not let this shake me up? I go back. I start reflecting. I start remembering. What does God's word say about this? Because when I hear things from people's lips sometimes, it, can, it concerns me. One, one of the things I often hear from people's lips is, well, Pastor, I feel. I feel, I feel, I feel. And I'm glad you've got feelings, right? The problem with feelings and how we feel about things is our feelings aren't always honest and true. There's only one thing that's true. It's God's Word that's true. And you always have to check your feelings with the truth, right? Check your feelings with the truth. So write it down. See, a good share of our problems 
in life come not because we're ignorant of truth, we don't know what the truth is, it's because we fail to either remember the truth or apply the truth that we've already received. De developing discipline to remember spiritual truth is an important practice in the Christian life. Developing some kind of way, some kind of discipline to remember spiritual truth is a very important practice in the Christian life. Right? Now, kids that play basketball, how do they, how do they train you to handle a press? They drill into you certain things that you keep going over and over and over and over in practice so that when the game comes, what? You know what to do. Right? And we're used to that. We drill all the time. We drill things that prepare us for the time when we have to use it, right? Drill, drill, drill. Prepare, 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 right? But amazingly, that doesn't always translate itself to the Christian life. Our exposure to truth is very limited. It might be Sunday morning for a few minutes when we are at church. And beyond that, we never even pick up God's Word. We never pick up the Bible. We never read our notes. We never, we never really uh, provide any kind of say, okay, you know, I'm going to face, I could face something today that could easily shape my composure, right? What do I got to do to prepare my heart and my mind with truth so that I can respond rightly to that situation? How do I train my mind for action? How do I train my heart for action? Right? What do I got to go over? What does the truth say? Okay? So, developing the dis discipline to remember spiritual truth is an important practice in the Christian life. But, as we continue in this passage, you notice in verse 6, Paul says something important. Another spiritual challenge is identified. And that is being able to internalize the truth we already have. Right? Notice the phrase... And you know is better translated, you have come to realize, right? What Paul is saying through that phrase is those in the church had arrived at this conclusion, he is, he's implying in the context that the knowledge that they had about the end times had not been internalized. They knew about it, but it hadn't been internalized, right? So what Paul is saying they are not acting in conjunction with the, what they know and believe. And that is the greatest challenge for every Christian, every believer. Acting on what you already know and believe is quite a challenge, right? That's a challenge before. I know a lot of things. I can quote you a lot of things. I've been in church. They've taught me a lot of things, right? So I know that. I understand that. But then the challenge is in internalizing that so that somehow it becomes a resource that we draw from when the pressure is on. Someone once told me, uh, for believers uh, in our society today, uh, we lack not in content or teaching, right? I mean, you go on the internet, you can get, you can have a sermon going before your mind any time of the hour, day, night you want. You, you can have somebody preaching and teaching you God's Word. You can have someone remind you of all these important truths in God's Word. So, um, content is never lacked, right? We have Bible studies. You can come Wednesday night. We'll talk about parables. You can come uh, Saturday morning. And the men will talk about uh, standing firm and being acting like men. You can have a lot of things, a lot of opportunities to get content to help you with your life, right? You get lots of content, right? So, the problem is lack of content. The problem is the lack of being able to put into practice what you Learn. It's called the application, right? So, so now how do I use this? Or will I use this? You know? And it's hard. It, that's one of the things that, that this teaching means nothing, right? Unless we do something. Right? And everything, every time we sit down before teaching is what is it telling me to do? What, what is it? What is it encouraging me to do? So you say, one thing I've already learned today is that God doesn't want me to be shook up with my composure, right? He doesn't want me to be confused in life, so he's given me truth to help me, right? The guy in my life. So the question then comes, what am I currently doing to learn truth, remember truth, and apply truth? Good question, right? Write that down. What am I currently doing to learn truth, to learn the truth? Bible reading plan might be one way. Submitting to some kind of small group Bible study, whatever else.
maybe listen to a sermon, podcast, whatever, that kind of thing. Learn the truth. What am I doing to remember the truth? And then most of all, what am I doing then to use this truth? Right? To give me confidence, to give me encouragement, to give me support in my life. Second thing, the events of the future will happen at God's timetable. Right? All the events of the future will happen on God's timetable. All creation lives under this, under the sovereign control of God, under God's sovereign control. That's in verse 6. And you know, the Word is always bringing comfort to us and confidence to Christians, knowing, hey, God's in control of this. It, it may things seem like well, the world is completely out of order. It may seem like things are going crazy. And I, I, I know. Um, one of the things that burdens everyone, I mentioned this last week, everyone that thing that burdens us living in America is what is going to happen in the world with this presidential election, right? Because it's kind of a crazy thing. As you view the candidates, their views, as you see the things that are taking place in society, you know, all, all, the, all the issues that the North Koreans are, you know, you know blasting off the nuclear, trying to get some nuclear weapons and we know what their kind of evil dictator kind of president's like. And, you know, there's just a lot of things that are going on in the world that just, just are kind of crazy. But the one thing that just sort of settles us in the middle of that, that would never allow us to really be shaken from our composure, is the fact that God is in control. Everything's working on God's time to you. And that's one of the important things that you need to remember as the days of the of the Lord unfolds, the events unfold in the days of the Lord. It's under God's control and it happens according to God's divine plan. Notice verse 6 where it says, so that he may be revealed in his time. You notice that? So he may be revealed in his time. Right? God has a time and a place and a work for the Antichrist in human history. The Antichrist has his time and his place. He won't show up before it is his time. God appoints that time. The Antichrist may think he, he's doing it on his own, but no, that is God's time for it to happen, right? The Antichrist will come just at the right time, at the appropriate time in history for God to accomplish his plan that he's already revealed to us in Scripture, that he revealed thousands of years ago. The sins of the world are being piled up in judgment through acts of evil. The Antichrist will come. There's a season. There's a right time. And just as there was a season. You remember in Jesus' ministry. You, you see that in the Gospel of John. He said, my time isn't coming. It's not my time. The, the Pharisees were plotting against him, trying to find a way to get him to kill him. He, he escaped. What? Because his time had not come. And then you see, towards the end, when Jesus, who was in control of that crucifixion? The Romans were. The Jews were. The Pharisees were. Uh, Jesus was in control. Because he gave up his life voluntarily for our sins. That's what this is all about. As we remember the Lord's Supper this morning, it was on Jesus' timetable. It was on God's timetable and plan. Not on the Romans, not on the Jews, not on anyone else. Because he voluntarily gave up his life to be a ransom for many, for our sins, for, for our forgiveness, for our life, for our eternity. Jesus has a plan and a purpose for every one of our lives, and that gives us confidence. Right? The Antichrist is a man. God will determine his season. And because of that, when you hear that in his time, that he says, hey, God's in control. I have a reason for confidence in life. Third, the Holy Spirit now restrains or holds back the full capacity of lawlessness in our society. Now, we have seen lawlessness in our society, have we not? We see that all the time. I mean, that's almost what the news is all about. It is the manifestation of lawlessness. People fighting against authority. People fighting against the rule of law. All over the place. Yeah. This week they had uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, the remake of his life. This very arrogant man, Ponzi scheme, ripped all these people out, out of their money, right? You know, um, you know, that's lawlessness, right? So the mystery of lawlessness, right, uh, is, is being, we see that sort of in society. But 
We see that the Holy Spirit that now restrains or holds back the full capacity of lawlessness in society will release his hold at some point in history so that the Antichrist can fulfill his mission. In fact, what's holding the Antichrist from stepping onto the world scene right now is the Holy Spirit restraining him. The Holy Spirit is restraining him. And what is keeping complete anarchy from breaking out in our society? Something's restraining it. God is restraining it. And don't get me wrong, they're preparing for it. Down in the Southwest, right on the story of this jade hell, they, they, they're working on martial law. You know, if something major tra traumatic happens in society, right? The power grid is shut down. Something catastrophic happened where, where society is up, you know, uh, there's training going on to prepare for people freaking out. Right? People are going to freak out. We don't, we don't ever think about that. Which, I mean, think about it. We're so used to everything working all the time. But you know, this is very culpable, this is very vulnerable. These lights, this power, the phones, everything is very, very vulnerable. Right? Something's restraining lawlessness right now. But it's still there. It's on the surface. It's on the cusp of, of just sort of breaking out. And we've seen signs of it. We've seen, you know, we've seen rioting. We've seen what's happened in society when things don't go people's way. You know, I can still remember when Rodney King's verdict came down. L.A. was just, just nothing but, you know, all kinds of riots and, you know, looting and all kinds of things. Now, that was many years ago. This is just how lawless people became. Now, New Orleans, before Katrina, and all the things that were going on there, you know, people get, a, you know, an opportunity to, you know, to kind of get a little piece of the pie and grab that flat screen TV and, you know, there's nobody, you know, there's not enough police officers to arrest everybody. And if people know that, I mean, there's not enough, if people want to be totally lawless, there is not enough, there are not enough police officers or sheriffs of the, in Yankee County to handle it. There just aren't. If people want to, I mean, look at look what they did in Minnesota. They tried to shut down I-94 by walking on the freeway, right? Trying to shut down the airport. Lawlessness. Trying to get their point across. So Paul's telling them this mystery of lawlessness. So what's he re what is he talking about? Many scholars have often suggested, but the best and most possible answer to this question, the mystery of lawlessness and the one who restrains this complete breakout or outbreak of lawlessness in society in the emergence of the Antichrist is the Holy Spirit. Who's holding back lawlessness right now? It's the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is the only person sufficient and powerful with supernatural power to put a restraint on evil becoming so prevalent in society that no one can stop it. Right? And I believe the removal of the restrainer will happen in conjunction with the rapture of the church. Okay? I believe that. For it is the power of the Holy Spirit to hold back and restrain the mystery of lawlessness is and already at work in the world is mediated, that power is mediated through the church, through believers. Because believers are lawful people. That's why I always say, there are Christians should, and this is years ago, I said Christians should never have fuss busters. Right? Why? You're, you, you're planning to be lawless, right? Wait a second, that, that's pretty hard. But, well, no, you're planning to be lawless. You're planning to break the law, right? The law says, I mean, he's already fast 80 miles an hour, right? Really? That's way too fast, right? But back in the day, you know, when it's 55, <laughs> we plan to be lawless. We just plan on it. That's, right? <laughs> Christians are to be the most lawful people 
Hillbilly Society. One of our members, I was in his office, and, and a co-worker was just dogging him about being lawful, about being righteous. And this person was just, just chatting it up. How they don't give in any kind of rules if they don't have to. And I said, how's that working for you? Kind of that about God spirit that just says, yeah, I don't really care. Well, yeah, don't care. Christians are to be lawful people. We're to be the best people on earth. We're to be representatives of, of heaven on earth so that people know heaven has come to earth. How do they know that? They, they run into lawful people. People who love to keep the law. Not as a, not as a, not as, because we're to earn our salvation. It's because we're saved. It's because Jesus lives in us that we want to be lawful people. Does it mean we always keep the law? Probably not. Does it mean that we don't struggle putting a fuzz buster in our car? Maybe that should be something we need to be a lot more convicted about. Because when the police officer does catch us and he sees that, and he sees your, your little fish sticker on the back, and he sees your bumper sticker in the front, he's saying, I think that part, your fuzz buster in the front, he's saying, I think that's a little bit hypocritical, isn't it? Right? Got to be careful what you put on your car and then how you drive. Right? If you're going to represent Jesus, you have to be careful, right? So the power of the Holy Spirit to restrain the mystery of lawlessness that's already at work in this world is mediated by the church. Certainly over the centuries, the Christian church um, has had its important moments in history, provided foundation, the establishment of law, in order to govern in societies. Regardless of what has been taking place in our courts today, the laws of our nation are really um, grounded in the law of God. As so you go to the Supreme Court building, what is the uh, etched engraving on the front of the building? It is Moses and the law, right? It's Moses and the Day of Man. I'm surprised they haven't found a way to take that off that building. Now I want you to think of something. What would you think this life, life on this earth would be like if, if the mystery of laws that the Bible talks, would, would the res, what's restraints and holds it back right now, would just be completely taken away? Think about it. What if every Christian was taken out of this world Everyone that seeks to be lawful is taken out of this world, and what's left over? Whatever re is restrained along is taken out of the way. What do you think life would be like? I think this place would be very difficult to live, even more so than it is now. Think about ISIS. Where did all that come from? That's a, that's a spirit of lost law, lawlessness. Mass shootings. Civil disobedience, lawlessness. Lawlessness is simply a dark spiritual force that is inspired by Satan himself. And at the core of that lawlessness is rebellion against God. God, I'm not going to serve you. I'm not going to follow you. I'm not going to submit to you. Your authority is going to be resisted by me at all costs. That's what the mystery of laws is about. It's people that do not want to submit to the authority of God. And Paul is telling Christians that the evil nature of the Antichrist's work is already present in this world. So it isn't going to be a surprise when it surfaces. It's already present in this world, but something's restraining it. And when that restraint is taken out of the world, look out. All hell breaks loose. Why? Because there's nothing restraining all of us. Nothing. The Holy Spirit's restraining it now for the church. The church is out. The dam breaks loose. Fourth thing. When Christ returns, he will put a decisive end to the destructive activities of the Antichrist. This is, this is the best part of the sermon. Jesus comes back. The Antichrist is having his heyday. He's being revealed in his time. The mystery of all lawlessness is, is, is being so exposed. Restraining influences all the way. The great tribulation takes place. 
But notice, the revealing of the Antichrist also means um, whose evil and destruction and whose rebellion and conflict, but it's really the prime moment for the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, who comes in this world and he asserts his authority. See, this, this is what the Jews were looking for during Christ's first coming. This is the Jesus they were looking for, who would come and assert his authority, right? Wipe out those Romans. And Jesus said, no, I came to suffer and die for your sins first. That's my second coming, when I will come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and from my mouth will come a sword that will slay with the breath of his mouth the Antichrist and all the forces of evil and darkness. That's the picture so many people had when Jesus first came. That's the Messiah we want. They got the, the Messiah with the sword, slaying people, slaying evil, slaying darkness, right? And Jesus said, that's a future time. My first coming is to save you from your sins. To save you from the power of the lawless, lawless one. To give you freedom and victory over the power of the lawless one, which is sin and death and hell. Christ came to give us freedom over that. Freedom from that. By dying on the cross, to pay the, the price for us, to become the, the, the sacrifice that we can appropriate by faith and receive eternal life in Jesus Christ. This second coming will end uh, we come at the end of the tribulation. Verse 8 says, The Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth the Antichrist. Folks, I, I, I just, you've seen this in, in kind of photo optic things in our society, right? You, you see how the Russians used to get all their goose stepper guys like this. And they bring all their big bombs. And the North Koreans do that too. They show off their might and their weaponry. And it's all stuff that they manufacture and make. And they think they're really bad. Right? They got it going, right? We got all the, we're going to just wipe people out, right? Look at this verse. Says, Jesus slays them with the breath. I want to tell you something. Your Savior is powerful. Because if he can slay the, the forces of darkness and evil, all mounted up against him with all of their evil and all of their, their massive, uh, mindful weapons of warfare. He can slay them with the breath of his mouth. He can take care of you to overcome any enemy and any foe that you face in your life. It may be a person. It may, it may be some, someone in your business, your job. It could be something uh, in a relationship, some foe that you are facing in life. Your Savior is powerful enough to take care of you in any situation. Jesus calls us to confidence. That says our Savior is no weak Savior. He's a powerful Savior. That it wants us to call on Him. Who is mighty to save. Who is powerful for His people. That even in their suffering. Even in their persecution. Even in them giving their death. For acknowledging Him. And their Savior will vindicate Him. Any person that gives their life for Christ, the Savior will come. He will right things wrong. He is going to establish His perfect righteousness on this earth. And He's going to slay with the breath of His mouth all of His enemies until they're under His feet. The question is, are you trusting in that Savior? Are you believing in that Savior? Have you given your life to that Savior? <coughs> That's the most important thing. I mean, in Revelation, we're told a sharp two edged sword comes out of his mouth. His command is cutting and final. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4 says, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips will slay the wicked. Who are the wicked? It's people who defiantly say, I will not submit to God. I will not love God. I will not serve God. I will not acknowledge Jesus Christ. I'm going to live in defiance of God. I'm going to do my own thing. If they teach me that stuff, I'm going to laugh. I'm going to walk in their face. The Bible says he'll slay the wicked with the breath of his mouth. Jesus is coming to put an end to sin. He's coming to put an end to Antichrist and to Satan. 
and their disruptive rule on this earth. Christ will appear and His visible presence will be in the world. Put an end, put a stop to all of this. There's one important thing for us to consider in light of this truth. It's the imperative is, will we be on Jesus' side when these things take place? It would be foolish for anyone here to reject Christ today and risk becoming a, a part of this day of wrath. The church has always lived with the understanding that this could come at any moment, at any time. This places the urgency on our mission as believers in Jesus Christ. People need to know the truth and the hope they have in Jesus Christ by surrendering and submitting to Him. And it's our responsibility to communicate this. We must never lose our burden for reaching lost people with the good news of Jesus Christ. We have a conquering Savior who wants to conquer our greatest enemy. You know our greatest enemy is sin? Our greatest enemy is we. We are our own enemies. We live in selfish rebellion against God. But God has come in mercifully and graciously said, I want to conquer that self-rule in life. And I want Jesus, I want to give you Jesus' rule and reign in life. And I want to show you how good life can be when you're willing to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Are you on Christ's team? Will you be with Jesus when he comes with his sword? Because with him are the armies of heaven, a robe in the glorious righteousness of Jesus Christ. You know, they're not wearing armor, they're not wearing shields and face masks, they're not wearing breastplates and, and boots and all kinds of stuff. They are, they, are, they are robed in the white garments of his righteousness because Christ doesn't need force to, to take care of lawlessness. All he needs is truth and the breath of his mouth, and it all fades before him. It all submits to him. When Christ asserts his reign and rule, people will surrender and submit to him, because he is Lord of heaven and earth. Is he Lord of your life? Have you surrendered to him? That's the most important thing. That's why we're here this morning, to remember the Lord's death. Jesus conquered sin and death by giving his life so that we could have life, so that we could have victory over sin and its power in our life, so that the kingdom of God could reign and rule in our hearts as we acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Father, I give you thanks for these four truths that we've talked about this morning. Lord, help us to remember the truth that you've given to us. Help us to remember that all things are happening, that you are sovereignly in control of all things in life. The Antichrist has a day and a time, and is according to your timetable. Lord, we're thankful that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives today, working in this world, still bringing people to salvation. We pray that we would yield to the power of the Holy Spirit in our life every day as we live. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are coming to, to, to assert your reign and rule, and we gladly surrender our hearts 